Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show, your home for open, honest, and provocative conversations. Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Happy Friday and welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. There's so much to get to. I'm fired up on this Friday because we have great, great guests. In just a bit, we're going to be joined by Seth Dillon. If you don't know that name, you probably know his work product. He's the CEO of the hilarious site, The Babylon Bee. Come on, how many times have you shared with your friends Babylon Bee headlines, right? They're so brilliant. Um, He's so clever, and he's got a lot to say about tech censorship. You would not believe the number of times that they've tried to crack down on his website, which is satire, as misinformation. Um, And the predictions that he's gotten right, right? It's like life imitates art. He makes these outrageous satirical predictions, and then they come true. So we'll talk to him about that. Um, Plus, we're going to show him and, and you an absolutely insane video from Microsoft this week that takes wokeness to the next level. I mean, here's a hint. It's no longer enough to say, now I, I, I guess I'd have to say, I'm Megan Kelly. I'm a white cisgendered woman who's straight and I have blonde hair and blue eyes and freckles. I don't, like, it's, they're going next level. We'll show it to you. But first, Jason Whitlock is here. He's the host of Fearless with Jason Whitlock on Blaze TV, all around great guy, incisive social commentator. And he and I both have a lot to say about the Colin Kaepernick documentary on Netflix. Uh, Also on Aaron Rodgers, the latest star athlete making headlines by being unvaccinated and apparently being a little untruthful about it. We'll get into it. Um, And then we're also going to discuss the latest on have you heard what's happening with Barstool Sports? The founder, Dave Portnoy, who's been on this show, is being accused of having, quote, violent and humiliating sex with two young women. I've got a lot of thoughts on this. We'll get to it in a minute. Um, And Jason's still fired up over the election results. So as you can see, a lot to discuss. Jason, great to see you again. How are you? I'm awesome. Thank you for having me again. You are the perfect person today for so many of these stories. I'm dying to talk about the Kaepernick documentary. I read your piece, so I know you've seen it, all six episodes of it, as now have I. I watched the whole thing. I was pleased that you had watched the whole thing as well, because as outrageous as that NFL slave trade comparison is and sort of the, the clip that's going around, the whole thing is so remarkable. And as usual, you nail it. So for our audience at home that hasn't seen any of it, I'm just going to reshow a little bit of that first clip. We have a few clips for you, but let's just start with the one where he opens up the very first episode comparing the NFL combine, where the NFL uh, muckety mucks take a look at incoming possible players to the slave trade. Here's the clip. Before they put you on the field, teams poke pride and examine you, searching for any defect that might affect your performance. No boundary respected, no dignity left intact. Because Colin Kaepernick's $43 million deal uh, in the NFL is just exactly like a slave being traded against his will uh, while not free. So what did you make of the series, Jason? And I mean, with that comparison in particular. Well, I think I was shocked because I saw that clip go out over social media. And then when I watched the series, I was like, oh, my God, this is the first scene In the documentary, I thought it would wait before getting really stupid and asinine. It did not wait. (laughs) It came right out of the box and just screamed, hey, I'm Colin Kaepernick. I'm an idiot. I don't know anything about uh, African-American history. I don't know anything about the degradation and the exploitation of slavery. I'm so stupid. I'm going to compare it to the NFL draft process 
which white and black players have been going through for decades. And Colin Kaepernick is com- comparing this NFL process, this power dynamic and it's slavery. And bl- but according to Colin Kaepernick, he's fighting to get back into the NFL. He wants back into slavery. I don't remember anybody that actually went through slavery fighting to get back into slavery. And so it just it opened and and said, look, I'm an idiot. Ava DuVernay, I'm an idiot. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it just got what what shocked me, Megan, is it just got worse from there. It's so deeply offensive. I mean, you can you imagine the outrage, Jason, if a white filmmaker slash host had had the nerve to compare the NFL draft to slavery? The, I, mean, I don't think his he's he's mixed race. He had a black father and a white mother. He was given up for adoption and raised by two white parents. I don't know that his black heritage gives him a pass to make such a disgusting comparison and diminish the most shameful chapter of American history by comparing it to something these guys participate in voluntarily, hopefully, with excitement. And the the reason that they're being examined is so that they can hopefully get a multi-million dollar contract to play the game of their dreams. That they can use that money to enrich and empower their family, friends, whatever it is they believe in. I don't think that was the slavery process. I I do want to say this, and I say it in 99% seriousness, a little bit of humor. There's no definitive proof that Colin Kaepernick's father is black. There's none. And I, 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 I looked at his Wikipedia one day, And they said, yeah, his father's from Ghana or Nigeria. They had this direct. And then the very next sentence was, no one knows who his father is. We don't know the identity of his father. It's never been established. And there's a lot of people that think, like, Colin looks more Middle Eastern. And when you go back and look at his kid photos before, you know, he had all this work done on his hair so he could wear this blowout afro, you go out and look at his kid photos. You look at Colin and you don't know what he is. You don't know. I mean, he certainly looks mixed race. But when he was a kid growing up uh, with his hair cut close, you didn't know what he was. He could have he could his dad could very easily be Middle Eastern. And so do I Colin Kaepernick's upbringing, his white mom biologically and two white parents and where he grew up. He did not have the typical black life and existence. And so for him, that's why he plays this dress up game. That's why he spends so much time on his hair and cornrows and afros. And that's why he's dressed up in a a T'Challa Black Panther suit in this uh, documentary or miniseries or whatever it is. He, He has to he's trying so desperately hard to be black from hairstyle to the way he dresses to, you know, the stupid things he says. And and what he doesn't realize is when you are black, you don't have to bend over backwards trying to prove it to everybody. Mm. Well, I read you say in your column, you wrote only a member of the KKK could fully enjoy this portrayal of black manhood. And I did. It did jump out at me, too, because he's he's sort of painting it as Oh, I'm going to sort of get in touch with my black roots, notwithstanding the fact that I have two white parents raising me. But the portrayal of black life. I mean, you tell me whether Ava and Colin have nailed it. I don't think they've nailed it. I I, I think that Ava, uh, I think, grew up in an adoptive home. Uh, I think Ava may be mixed race as well. And I'm not trying to denigrate mixed race people, but I think they have identity issues. And so Colin's perception of what represents blackness as portrayed in the miniseries that he and Ava DuVernay controlled was, okay, cornrows, 
if you have cornrows, he put Allen Iverson on a pedestal and said Allen Iverson embraced his blackness or embraced his culture. He braided his hair. So we've established that cornrows are essential to being black. Then we established basically and through the, throughout that highly seasoned fried food. That's what being black is. Every time the two times Colin showed up in a black house, there was fried chicken and pork chops and Crisco and collard greens everywhere. And, and Colin just, if you watch it, and I'm not kidding, watch it yourself. But, oh, Colin just felt naturally at home mm-hmm. whenever there was fried chicken and extra seasoned food popping yeah. off. And his white mother, uh, she didn't cook that way. But, oh, you know, Colin, as soon as he goes to these black homes, uh, you know, the food is just incredible. And, and I'm saying, look, I love soul food. My, I can cook. My mother can cook. My father was a heck of a cook. My brother's a hell of a cook. And but that highly seasoned food leads to diabetes, heart disease, blood pressure issues and a bunch of other stuff that, you know, Colin said, well, that's black. And and then the other just small little subtle things. And, and it's like the nuclear family is no part of their portrayal of black existence in America. And and maybe that's the most accurate thing they showed because 75% of black kids are being born into single parent situations or unmarried situations. But, but the portrayal of the black family, there were two instances early on. It was two black lesbian couples uh, two different ones. There was no black man of any uh, importance ever portrayed in this. There was some uncle that asked him some s- silly questions at at his his girlfriend or some woman he mm-hmm. briefly dated house or whatever. I, I the portrayal of black people in this was embarrassing, and it's it was- something that you would expect a white racist to put together, not. Colin Kaepernick and Ava DuVarnay, two of the blackest people allegedly on the planet. Mm. The portrayal of white people wasn't much better. Uh, virtually every single white person in the in this in the series is a racist, including his parents. And I know you took issue with this, too. But, man, it was uncomfortable to watch him take aim at his mother, his adoptive mother, who is his mother. Uh, he has no relationship with his biological mom. And she's a white woman. They've they've been, you know, seen publicly together. They've given joint interviews in the past. I didn't know that there was a rift between them. And I don't know sitting here now whether there is. But man, he portrays her and his adoptive dad as racists. And, um, you know, that his mother. Mm, I'm not so to- sure if I would go as far as racist. I think he portrayed them as idiots. OK. All right. Well, she he takes issue with his mom calling him a thug because of his hair. And then the mother, definitely he's suggesting she was a racist because he, well, I'll show you the clip. This is, um, Oh, that's right. See. Yeah. They, she, we're, she yeah, allegedly four, was upset. He took a black girl to the homecoming dance, yeah. which I just, that's preposterous. Well, that, so that, stand by. Here's the clip. We can play him back to back. Number four, and number yeah. five. This is how he portrays his mom. It's Colin's photos. one thing gold is her color yes yes it is is this what any man by blue black well i'm not gonna worry myself you know how these kids are it's probably just a, a passing phase and Colin will be so caught up in sports, probably forget all about her. So, yeah, before we get to the thug one, she's lamenting the the girl's skin color, that she's she's dark. That's what the mother's lamenting. And it plays off of an earlier phone call in, involving the phrase blue black, as you heard. I mean, it's just wow. Your thoughts on it? Uh, I, I, I it's not that I forgot that. But I still contend 
what his intent was, was to portray them as idiots. And I think it was unfair. Uh, I think more than unfair, I, I just, it's despicable the way he portrayed his parents. Uh, he, he, at one point in the documentary, he, I was never anybody's first choice. And he basically alleged that his parents wanted a white baby and had to settle for, uh, for Colin. Look, his two biological parents abandoned him. These two Christian people took him in, loved him, raised him, uh, bent over backwards in support of his football aspirations, his academic aspirations, whatever his aspirations were. And then to come out and put out some mini series that portrays them as this type of buffoon and this racially insensitive. First of all, Black parents will say to their kids, hey, you're wearing your pants too low. Are you trying to be a thug? Hey, uh, I don't like your hairstyle. Are you trying to be a thug? What are you getting tattoos all over your body? Are you trying to be a thug? This goes on in black homes all the time. My father. Hey, why you got that earring on? You know, that's not corporate. That's not professional. And my father loved black people. My father, just to be quite frank with you, and my father's an awesome human being, but he was a racist. He did not like white people. He experienced some things in his life uh, that, you know, he couldn't let go of. Uh, and so my father, uh, I can remember coming home from college and staying with my father one summer, and and my father, hey, uh, these white girls calling this house, that needs to stop. And so parents say and do some things that aren't always appropriate, but air them out this way, portray mm -hmm. them as, as this kind of idiots and this kind of is absolutely ridiculous. And for, mm -hmm. for, for it not to be stated clearly in some sort of way in this miniseries, because Colin's narrating. And so let's say, that these events, which I think are fabricated, but let's say they're accurate. Colin had every opportunity as the narrator to come and put some context around what we what he just showed. And it would be just like me saying, look, because my, my father did not like white people. I can put a lot of context and reasons why he did not like them. Things that happened to him in his life that made him that way. So you put the context around it so people can understand it. There was no context other than these people are idiots and they're despicable. And they allegedly had some problem with him taking some black girl to a dance and Megan, I'm 54. I I've known a lot of people in a lot of different situations. I've never met a white person who has a problem with any black boy or biracial boy or mixed race boy dating a black woman well I've he's never suggesting seen that I, yeah that his parents did because they had this this race problem there was there was a clip where he said that the mother called him a thug this is only 10 no, seconds no. long here it is yeah here i'll play no. it number five you're cutting your hair colin i don't want to too bad why we told you it's a team rule but why because you look like a thug that was it and so, um, the only yeah, thing I would say was different here is that saying you look like a thug and saying you are a thug, two different things. And I'm just sorry. Black parents have that conversation with their kids all the time. Well, and it depends, right? My, my, white moms and all moms have conversations with their daughter. You look like a slut. You're not wearing that. Like it's it depends on the, the context and the circumstances. And so if a white a white boy with his dad and or mom, if he grows his hair too long, the word may not be thug, but there's some sort of, again, some sort of negative connotation, like, hey, cut your hair, you look like an idiot, you look like, uh, you know, a druggie, or you look like something. Mm -hmm. And and so parents, and arguing about the hairstyles of their kids, this goes on. And, and so what Colin isn't smart enough to understand is this like parent this is what parents do and maybe well, everything i mean you tell me jason I, when i watch this the whole thing is like he is so aggrieved at 
everything. He's mad that the the umpire on the baseball field allegedly said no fraternization when he he did a head nod to one of the one other black player on the field. If so, that's bizarre. I don't know why an ump would do that. Maybe it was racism. I don't know. But for that to wind up in a movie about his life, like that's that's the key moment of racism. He wants to point people back to his coach telling him he really needed to play baseball professionally, not football professionally, because he was better at baseball and he was only going to be second best if he went to football. Okay, that's that's a thing like that. I don't. Oh, all right. I, he's still aggrieved by it. He's got, um, you know, person after person who he thinks have done him wrong and made him, quote, second choice, as you point out. He points out how America doesn't believe in black women as beautiful. And I'm thinking, sitting there thinking like, okay, tell it to Beyonce, tell it to Holly Berry. Maybe, maybe years and years ago, he goes back to the 1930s to talk about the one baseball player who has said, you got to play as a white man if you want to, you got to sort of pass as a white man. Okay, it was a hundred years ago. Like, it was terrible. No one's arguing we weren't a racist this country back then but these are his examples of what america is and why he says you've got to play you got to play the game the right way what they really mean is you got to play the game the white way and he portrays our country never mind his upbringing as though we're still in 1930 megan and here's why a lot of the stuff he showed i just absolutely do not believe i think it's fabricated. I think 90% of this stuff is completely fabricated. I don't believe his white best friend told him, Hey man, I know I steal hubcaps and, and, and Jack cars, but if I did it with you, I would get shot by the police. Yes, right. If I just do it myself, I'll get arrested. Let's cut That's it right. out. That's in there. I, the, the other farcical, I mean, just farcical. He shows his, and, and this thing was told in such a stupid, Ill, illogical way. His dad every day is driving down the highway, speeding oh, yeah. and waving at the cop uh, as he drives by. And the cop clocks him going past the speed limit. And then the one day Colin gets in the car and drives, the cop immediately pulls him over. But they literally show like his dad waving at the cop as he drives by speeding. <laughs> and I'm like, Colin. <laughs> Ava, are, are are you suggesting that in this very white town that that this guy lived in, that they only pulled over white uh, black people, so they only wrote a a ticket a month or two? Uh, I mean, this is just comical the way he portrayed racism and how it impacted him. It all felt fabricated mm. because I just don't think he experienced much racism. He has no idea what it actually looks like. So he portrayed and neither does Ava, clearly. So they portrayed it in the most farcical way possible. I mean, it's a fascinating way to think about him as this figure that, you know, kneeled during the national anthem and it was the one who started that. And and what you're positing is it makes perfect sense because it's it's on the heels of a lifetime of fakery, of glomming, of somebody who who is sort of adjacent to people of color who have had an actual black experience, but you you don't actually buy it given the way that he actually was raised. And I mean, I'm sure he does have a black dad. I have no idea what his he says his dad was black and his and his mom was white his biological parents but he was obviously raised by white people and he clearly struggles with that if you watch this film um i don't know i will say the whole thing made me uncomfortable the way he portrayed black families the way he portrayed white people as well and the way he portrays our country and the fact that he's being celebrated by netflix you know for for this kind of storytelling and ava too uh, comparing the nfl draft to slavery uh is an embarrassment i don't recommend you watch it. It's not worth your time. I'm sorry I had to six, sit through the six <laughs> episodes, though I will say the young actor who played the young Colin, Colin Kaepernick was quite good, and he was pretty charming. Way more so than the actual Colin, I think. What what I think, I guarantee you this wins some sort of award. Definitely. That, that Hollywood is going to hop behind it and give it some sort of award. And, and make it one of my favorite, like, not one of my favorite movies, but I enjoy the movie Clueless. And it's about, you know, yeah. blonde girl or what. And that's this was the the half black version of Clueless. 
that that's what this movie this should have been a comedy i'm telling there were comedic yeah. elements yes. this <laughs> it's it, true this was the like a babylon b version of colin kaepernick's life oh that's the perfect that's the perfect tease <laughs> for our next hour when we have the ceo of babylon b coming on all right wait we have much more uh, to do with jason coming up aaron Rodgers, dave portnoy under fire accused of a me too type situation which he thoroughly denies we'll get into that next stay tuned I want to talk to you about Blue Blocks and their amazing blue light blocking glasses. These things are a game changer. Since getting a pair of these amazing glasses, I have had no more headaches or fatigue when looking at the computer screen or watching TV or using my phone. They're going to help you feel better and sleep better. I wear them when I'm using digital devices, and they truly have been a game changer for me, and they will be for you too. They are legitimately a game changer. My friend was telling me to get them, and I'm not going to lie, I mocked her a little bit. I'm like, mm-hmm. They work. It's real. They come in non-prescription, prescription, and reading options, and they're made in an optics laboratory in Australia with fast, fast shipping to the United States. And I also wear their Sleep Plus glasses two to three hours before bed, and I have not slept this well in years. Seriously, all that like blue light on your eyes, it's not good right before you go to sleep, and it could be affecting your nightly Zs. This is the way to get to go forward. Highly recommend getting a pair for yourself, and by the way, for your spouse, and you will be amazed with how well you feel after just one use. My favorites are the Aero Sleep Plus glasses, and I also love their Remedy Sleep Mask, which is 100% blackout, which gives me the best night's sleep. Go to blueblocks.com slash MK. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X dot com slash MK. Use that code MK because that's what's going to save you 15% off. Why wouldn't you get that if you could? Plus, it helps me out, so I appreciate it because that tells them that, you know, you went there because you saw this Uh, and do it now. Blueblocks.com slash MK and use code MK to save 15 percent. Okay, so Dave Portnoy of Barstool Sports finds himself on the wrong end of Business Insider in what they deem an exclusive, an article written by Julia Black. She's apparently been working on it for months. He claims she gave him just a few hours to respond to these claims. Uh, the, The headline is, quote, I was literally screaming in pain. Young women say they met Barstool Sports founder Dave Portnoy for sex, and it turned violent and humiliating. She's got two stories in particular. He's put out a response denying anything non-consensual you know he admits hooking up with some young women but says nobody told me that they weren't enjoying it or didn't want to be there um let me just give you the flavor uh madison is the first story summer 2020 again he's denying anything non-consensual this is according to business insider this isn't dave's side this is madison's side she sent dave portnoy a dm Sick pizza reviews, she wrote. Then he responded, thanks, fly bitch. That's apparently a reference to something that was on her shirt in the picture that she sent him. A 20-year-old college student at the time, Port and Portnoy was a 43-year-old multimillionaire. Um, the conversation so- soon moved to Snapchat and text, where it quickly turned into the topic of sex. He sent her graphic videos of other women he'd slept with, according to Madison, and he pressed her to tell him about her sexual fantasies. She responded, like a rape fantasy, where I don't have any control over what's going on. He responded, you and I are going to get along so well. Um, But I have to feel pretty comfortable for you to do that one, says Madison. Of course, says Portnoy. And he bought her a first class plane ticket to visit him at his Nantucket home. The trip was, quote, traumatic, Madison told Insider. She arrived at his four bedroom home around 3 p.m., tired enough for her travel. She didn't mind when he said, let's order pizza in instead of going out. Still, she was surprised to find him nothing like his charismatic online persona. He was very rude and so on. After dinner, they started kissing. She said she first became uncomfortable when Portnoy pulled out his phone and started filming her without asking permission as she performed oral sex on him. I never said anything. I was scared. He was just so mean, she said. And then she goes on and I'll get to the the remainder. But I have to say, Jason, when I read this as a mother of a daughter, as a woman who's grown up in a in a man in a world that was probably far more patriarchal when I was this girl's age than it is today. All I could think was, oh, you you felt uncomfortable when he pulled out his phone and started filming you as you were filleting him after not knowing him at all, accepting his first class class plane ticket and getting down on your knees with a man who you only knew the public persona of. And then you were surprised it wasn't working out well, that he wasn't your Prince Charming. Take some responsibility. 
take it's it's not that he has no responsibility to treat her well. I don't want people to misunderstand me, but she's 100 percent responsible for putting herself in that position to begin with. This is the reason the vast majority of women would never do such a crazy thing as this young woman did. And now all eyes are trained on him because he was apparently, according to her, rough, so rough I felt like I was being raped. He videotaped me. He spat in my mouth. He choked me so hard I couldn't breathe. Again, he's denying this. And I was screaming in pain. I screamed too much, too much. It hurts. He denies that, too. Um, and then she she stayed there two days. They didn't sleep together again. She slept on his couch. I'm sorry. Any young woman, uh, like, there's a lesson in here for young women nationwide. Don't do this. Don't slide into somebody's DMs. Don't accept their plane ticket to go visit a man you don't know. Don't fillet him after dinner when you don't know him. And don't be surprised when he takes out his phone and starts filming you. And then don't play the victim because you put yourself in that situation. He doesn't come off looking well at all. He's got his own conscience to answer to. But this woman made terrible choices. And I don't think we get ahead in the Me Too movement or as women in general by not accepting that we, too, have some responsibility for our own actions and placing ourselves in situations that can lead to bad results. Okay, that's my rant. I'm going to turn it over to you, my friend. And I can't disagree with anything you said. And I think as a woman, I think that's a natural first reaction. As a man, I have a different first reaction. Yeah, this is why I and love talking it, to you. <laughs> and it's it's it. And again, I think your reaction is perfectly appropriate. And that's why you know men and women should work together in conjunction with the raising of their kids. And so I, I guess, and you know, I'm ten years older than Dave. And so if I were Dave's older brother or father, you know, I, I look at I I hear that story. And I'm repulsed by his behavior and, mm -hmm. and I'm repulsed for a couple of reasons. One, he's got to know his position. This is Dave Portnoy at 43, not 33. This guy's a multimillionaire representing Penn National, Barstool, hundreds of employees. He can't put himself in this position. You can't be in the DMs of 20 year olds and sending them uh, first class plane tickets to come and give you a blow job. Just can't do it. Mm -hmm. Those days are over when you have the kind of responsibility that he has. And so the lack of self-awareness and then just the, the, the lack of regard for this is a 20 year old child. Oh, and, come and, on. And I, She's not when a you're child. 43. No, no, She's I, not a child. I, I'm going to say when you're 43 and I've been 43 and, and again, may I have a, uh, just being completely honest, I like younger women, <laughs> but I don't like children. And I'm just yeah. a, at 43, 20 is a child. Now, if she's 25 out of college in the workforce, you know, that's an adult. And in, in my view, and is far more fair game than a 20 year old child when you're 43. And again, I don't have any problem with 40 year old men or 50 year old men that like to date 30 year old women or 28 year old women or whatever. But they've been around. They, they got some hair on their <laughs> wherever. Yeah. Yeah. I don't say hair on their chest. or what. So I'm just telling you from from a man's perspective, mm -hmm. that's the way I see it. He's the power dynamic. He's a multimillionaire. This is a 20 year old. There's so much imbalance here mm -hmm. and him putting himself. I don't disagree with that. I don't, I, don't agree, I don't disagree with what you're saying. He yeah. also bears responsibility, and now he's feeling panicked. It's not just her, by the way. It's a 19 year old named Allison, who, uh, according to the piece, sent Portnoy a message saying she was on the island. I think Nantucket would love to see him. He invited her over. She asked whether she could come by with a couple of friends. He said, "While we f seems weird," she responded, "Nah, they don't mind." Very playful. She's obviously telegraphing. She's in for sex. Um, she got there. He went inside. She said, I'll go in with you. He said, I didn't know it'd be that easy. He leaned in, started kissing me. I didn't know what to do. We went upstairs. He was really aggressive. I didn't know what to do. We had sex. That was it. He kicked me out. Her memories were fuzzy because of her emotional distress. She claimed that he choked her. Again, he kept spitting in my mouth, which was really gross. I was kind of scared. I didn't want to disappoint him. And then she claims that she... She, oh, 
her friends say she was uncharacteristically quiet afterward. And all I could think was, okay, because you put yourself in a situation where you devalued yourself and you allowed somebody else to debase you, you, the reason, I mean, I was look, I'm not a perfect angel, Jason, but the reason that I don't have these experiences in my past is because I've never slept with somebody who I didn't deeply care for and no deeply cared for me. That's just not been my MO. And is that just happenstance and luck in my situation? No, it's not. I lost my dad to a, at a very young age. I haven't had a perfect life, but I always understood that that is a, is a next level behavior. And you have to, especially as a young woman, be very careful about who you're who you allow to have that kind of intimate access to you. Not everyone will treat you right. Not everyone will be good to you. And it can go south fast. So that's both parties bear responsibility in these situations. It's not, if he had just grabbed them and assaulted them, this would be all on him. But these women were willing participants. And then when they found out he was a cad to be charitable, um, they had more than just him to blame. She claims she became suicidal. He's released text messages showing that she seemed to be pursuing um, another encounter with him after the fact. So he's challenging that. And I should stay for the record. Here is part of Dave Portnoy's defense, the full version of which you can catch online. Watch. Get into the two allegations that are jarring. And if I read them not knowing me, I'd be like, this guy does uh, belongs behind bars, basically. At no point. She came, she flew, we did have pizza, hung out, hooked up, at no point during it, at no point was it not 100% consensual. At no point did she ask me to stop. At no point did either of us think something unseemly happened. There was no weirdness after. It was totally fine, normal interaction, sexual, 100% consensual. Incident number two, I had no idea about, which is basically a girl came over in Nantucket. Um, she DM'd me, she asked to come over, she came over, we hung out by the pool, started hooking up, had sex, and then it says she went home, um, got super depressed. She took a selfie with me, got super depressed when the selfie circulated, and three days later was in the hospital with depression. The first one, I'll never be able to prove my side of the story, ever. The he said, she said. Um, I swear to God on my life, I'm telling the truth. Uh, the second one, at least I have something to back it up. Mm. You're, it's an interesting point you're making, which is even if you I, believe his denial, I want to let him off the hook. That I tend to believe what Portnoy is saying. However, and again, the, the like the point of view of my show, my my worldview is like we're at a time in America where the whole country is in chaos, moral decay, and it's because men have fallen and failed. And that's why I'm critical here of Dave Portnoy. I'm just sorry. In his position, a 19 and a 20-year-old, he's in his 40s. He represents Penn National. He represents Barstool. He's got female employees. He's got putting himself in this position, behaving this, in my view, inappropriately with 19 and 20-year-old children. I'm just, it's unacceptable. Men have to do better. If we're going to get this country back on track, men are going to have to step up and answer to a higher standard of behavior that, than what he's exhibiting here from a leadership position. This is unacceptable. This is why our country's in chaos. It, it all ties together. This is why, uh, you know, Marxism and, and, and just our whole country is just out of line because Men can only think about momentary pleasure and, and whatever satiates them instantly. Again, I've been a public figure for a long time. I don't have hundreds of millions of dollars like uh, Dave Portnoy, but I've been wealthy for a long time. And I've been in position two weeks ago. I'm going up my building, uh, up my elevator in my building, and I hit the penthouse level, a 21 and a 22-year-old girl. Hey, oh we want to go up and see your apartment. They're not going to say I behaved anything like what yeah. Dave Portnoy just did because yeah. I understand my position. They were attractive. I like attractive young women, mm -hmm. but I'm just not an idiot. And <laughs> there's a higher standard that I have to hold myself to <laughs> than just can I get a blowjob and film somebody while doing it 
That's just dis. That's college frat boy behavior, yeah. not the leader of a company. Well, I will say this. I I think what the theme that's emerging here is y- you're asking for men to do better. I'm asking for women to do better. And that's because you and I are both take responsibility kind of people. You know, I I don't excuse his behavior, but I also don't excuse theirs. And I think they're not children. They're they're young adults and they need to make better choices. Young women have been sexualized, over sexualized and taught by modern day media that their sexuality should be exploited to the max and that that's somehow how empowering and it isn't you know what's empowering is to have sex on the terms that you want with somebody you love and who you know cares about you then go to town get down go for it you and i have talked about this before um but you put yourself in bed with a stranger anything can happen and if you don't remember that things are not going to go well for you in your life inside or outside of the bedroom because it's it speaks to some to a recklessness recklessness on both uh sides okay i gotta ask you about aaron Rodgers. so he is in big trouble because he suggested that he was vaccinated and now he has COVID, which doesn't mean he's not vaccinated. But ESPN is reporting he is not vaccinated and he lied when he said the following. Listen to this sound by 10. Yeah, I've been immunized. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of conversation around it, around the league and a lot of guys who have made statements and have made statements, owners who made statements. Um, you know, there's guys on the team that haven't been vaccinated. Uh, I think it's a personal decision. I'm not going to judge those guys. <laughs> He's just really not judging them because he was apparently one of them that didn't actually get. He said he had some homeopathic remedy. He was asking the NFL to consider a, a vaccine and they didn't. And now he's being ripped. Like Stephen A. Smith came out and said, like, he wasn't man enough to just admit like some of the other guys. I didn't get it, and I'm not going to get it. He wanted. He didn't want the media pounding. Uh, I don't know. What's what's your take? Uh, look, I think it's ridiculous that we're requiring these young people uh, in the prime of health, uh, people that micromanage everything that goes into their bodies so they can perform at the highest level. I think it's ridiculous that we're forcing these vaccines on them in the NFL and the NBA. Uh, so – because I lean that way, mm-hmm. I'm I, I'm I'm giving Aaron Rodgers a pass. I wish that he had been man enough to handle it the way that Kyrie Irving has handled it in the NBA. And because we need Aaron Rodgers, like I think Lamar Jackson, another great NFL quarterback, he hasn't taken the vaccine and he's been upfront about it. Kirk Cousins, he's been upfront about it. But if Aaron Rodgers and and I believe Tom Brady. Should have been. And I know Tom Brady pretends or says or maybe he has actually taken the vaccine. It's hard for me to believe. But I don't think Aaron Rodgers is alone in the athletic world in in ducking the vaccine. Uh, And so I'm 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 just not going to be hypercritical of him because I think all these young people in in professional sports. COVID's no risk to them. They don't want to take the vaccine and they shouldn't be forced to. I agree with you. I feel uncomfortable with the questions it's like do you have an std which std do you have what is it is it is it herpes what do you have herpes aaron Rodgers? do you do you do you do you do you and then when when somebody not saying aaron Rodgers has herpes but like when somebody responds no i don't have an std and then it turns out they they do we're like liar liar because that's how society is behaving toward people who haven't gotten the vaccine they're that they're they're to be demonized ostracized no wonder the guy didn't want to say he hadn't done it you get Get pilloried now as though you've done something really evil. And then we we paint ourselves as the moral arbiters when we catch you, you know, saying, ah, liar. Well, we're the ones who put you in that position to begin with. It shouldn't be any of our business. It should not be any of our any of our business, Jason. Well, football teams l- hate distractions. And if Aaron Rodgers is on the record as big a profiles he has in the NFL, if he's unvaccinated, his whole season would be dominated by questions about his vaccination status. Mm. When it's Kirk Cousins, who's not on Aaron Rodgers level, it's a it's a story for a day or two and then it goes away. But when it's Aaron Rodgers, it's an everyday story. Again, people say, well, no one's harassing Lamar Jackson. 
And just quite frankly, Megan, that's because Lamar Jackson's black and most of the media is afraid of being critical of any black athlete because they'll get smeared as racist. Aaron Rodgers is a white guy. Aaron Rodgers already has a bit of a reputation with the media. Uh, and he knows exactly how this would have played out had he started the season out. Yeah, I'm, I'm anti-vax. I'm not taking it, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, he's a major story and everywhere he goes, there's protesters, perhaps there's harassment. There's And so he tried to avoid it. Again, I'm sounds like I'm making a bunch of excuses for him. But all of these young athletes from Kyrie Irving to any of them that don't want to take the vax, more power to them. I've said it a million times. The vaccine is for fat 50 year old people like me. Uh, it's not for in their prime athletes. <laughs> it, 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 they have no business taking this. If you're young, you're not done having kids. No way you should take this vaccine. All right. Now, first of all, you I you may be in your 50s, but you're not fat. And I'm 50 and I'm not fat. And I took the vaccine. I'm glad to have taken it. But I don't believe in the mandates either. And I do believe the vaccine can definitely reduce your hospitalization risk and your death risk, especially if you're older and, you know, certainly older than 50, which I will be as of November 18th. Um, but in any event, you're looking good. You're actually looking really good, Jason. And it's always so good to talk to you. Let me tell you something, Megan. If I looked 18 like you do, I might take the vax too. You're aging backwards. <laughs> You're the Benjamin Button of Hulk. You're so fun. All right, we'll see you over on your show on The Blaze. Such a pleasure. Say hi to Uncle Jimmy. Thank you. All right, coming up, Babylon B CEO Seth Dillon will be with us. We're looking forward to that. He got a nice tease from Jason. This guy's been prescient. His sat satirical predictions are coming true one by one. How does he do it? And remember, everyone, you can find The Megan Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east and the full video show and clips when you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube dot com slash Megan Kelly. It was one week ago today that we caught a bird invade our studio and Abby, my huntress assistant, had to save the day and it's all caught on cam. See what you're missing if you're not watching the YouTube show? Um, or if you prefer, by the way, you can just subscribe to the audio podcast, uh, download an Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, and that's a good way of sharing it with folks who missed it. There you'll find our full archives with more than 190 shows, including an interview with Dave Portnoy and some great ones with Jason prior to today as well. Go ahead and check them out. So one of the things we wanted to bring to you today was um, the reaction to Tuesday's big electoral victories by Republicans, including Winsome Sears as lieutenant governor of Virginia. You would think that people would be celebrating her uh, first black official to hold that office in the state of Virginia. Uh, very different reaction on places like MSNBC and with Joy Reid and her guest. Take a listen to them. So you had the choice of two brown slash black people and you picked one of them. Do you get credit? Right. They want white supremacy by ventriloquist effect. There is a black mouth moving, but a white idea through the running on the runway of the tongue of a figure who justifies and legitimates uh, the white supremacist practices. So to have a black face uh, speaking in behalf of a white supremacist legacy is nothing new. If you tell black people, look, I support a Negro. Look, there is a person of color that I am in favor of. And that person of color happens to undermine and undercut and subvert the very principles about which we are concerned, you do yourself no service by pointing to them as an example of your racial progressivism. Our executive producer, Steve Krakauer, is a media critic. Steve, so it's a ventriloquist situation if a black conservative wins and the white people are presumably the puppeteers. Yeah, this is, you know, it's funny. This is actually something Michael Eric Dyson has said previously uh, about another uh, black politician, Daniel Cameron, who's been on this show, uh, on another MSNBC interview, I believe also with Joy Reid. It's 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 kind of crazy to me. I, I You know, Megan, I, I emailed a friend of mine who I will not reveal who works at NBC and MSNBC. I said, are you cool with this? Is this is this good? And they, they sort of said, oh, you know, it's a guest. It's not the host. Uh, okay, <laughs> sure. Right. I'm sure she totally disagreed with him, as was reflect. Oh, wait. <laughs> Steve, interesting seeing you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Babylon Bee CEO Thanks, Seth Dillon is next. 
Welcome back to the Megan Kelly Show. Joining me today, Seth Dillon, the owner and CEO of the Babylon Bee. What a gift the Babylon Bee is. A hilarious site that drives the media insane, even more so than they normally are, and gets them to call funny stories that are obvious parody misinformation. Seth, welcome. Thanks for having me on, Megan. It must be so fun for you when someone like the New York Times actually tries to engage in a fact check of you guys or tries to call you out as misinformation only to be checked by you on its misinformation because you're a satirical site not offering facts up for actual consumption as journalism. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you make that point because that's the point I always like to make is that it's just this like rich irony that they're accusing us of misinformation while using misinformation to smear us in that right. uh, in the same breath. So, um, yeah, it is it is a little silly and ridiculous. And I'm glad they retracted that uh, statement about us because it was uh, pretty slanderous and false and silly. I mean, look, we're we're trying to make people laugh. We're trying to make them think, too, but we're trying to make them laugh. And satire is a legitimate enterprise. And just because we're making jokes that you don't like um, doesn't mean that we're somehow maliciously trying to mislead people. Um, it's, it's, it's the most bizarre thing, but, I, but it, it's, it's really true though. There's a grain of truth in every joke. A lot of these jokes are going to be believable and that's not an indictment of satire. In fact, it's an indictment of the people that you're making fun of. It's a, an indictment of the people that you're mocking because it's actually believable. The joke that you're making that says yes. something about them. Yes, you've been misinterpreted as a truthful reporting site by everyone from The New York Times to Donald Trump while in the Oval Office, (laughs) though I I understand you were assured he knew it was satire, though mm, the tweets suggest otherwise. But here are just a couple of headlines. I pulled some of my favorite. We have a great friend who my husband and I text with all the time, uh, headlines from you guys, because they're just so clever. And we always read the articles and laugh. And I just pulled like a few of my favorite because I went back on the text chain just to see. All right. for, For folks who have had their heads under a rock and don't know about the Babylon Bee. These are some of your uh, reports. Scandal as Newsom campaign produced old yearbook photo showing Larry Elder in blackface. (laughs) So that's (laughs) amazing. Then Biden hires interpreter to translate his speeches into English. Um, Experts warn of new Cuomo variant that is dangerous to young women, fatal to elderly. Uh, Kamala Harris visits Tomb of the Unknown Soldier to to tell them to enjoy the long weekend. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Here's a couple of my favorites. AOC claims her abuela died in an attack on Capitol. <laughs> that actually could be true. AOC added to be. Iwo Jima Memorial for surviving Capitol riot. <laughs> then this was low-hanging fruit, but I got to give it to you anyway. Tubin reinstated in touching interview. I got off easy. <laughs> <laughs> then there's Biden continues rollback of Trump policies like peace in the Middle East. <laughs> So ridiculous. The latest one was Dems announced plan to call people racist even harder. <laughs> <laughs> that's how what do they're doing, though, right? These? I mean, that's it just is, but how do you come up with them? How do we come up with them? I mean, yeah. look, uh, you, you know, we're, we're trying to exaggerate the truth to make a point. So we get up in the morning and look at the headlines and look at what's going on in the news. Uh, and, and, and we think, how can we take this a step further to kind of draw out the absurdity or the hypocrisy that's there? Um, honestly, it's pretty challenging. And in fact, a lot of people think that there, this is a lot of low hanging fruit. Like it's a lot easier to do satire in this environment. I would say it's actually a lot harder, uh, because the world has already become like this parody of itself. And so we're kind of parodying a parody, which is, you know, rather challenging. Yeah. Is it, I mean, for you, cause you're basically in the comedy business. So how are you reacting as you see comedy being banned? There's no more comedy. Comedy's done. It's canceled. Dave Chappelle, he's not really canceled, but comedy's kind of canceled left and right. And we've had a bunch of comedians on this show that talk about it. It must be particularly galling to you. It is. Well, I mean, so what What in particular is being canceled is, uh, you know, uh, jokes that are aimed at the wrong target. You know, you're allowed to joke about plenty of things. You're allowed to joke about, for example, a straight white Christian man like me, um, I'm, you know, that that's perfectly allowed. What they're mm-hmm. trying to outlaw is this, uh, this whole notion of like punching down and it's making jokes of, uh, people who are, uh, beneath you essentially. And on this like hierarchical structure of intersectionality and oppression, um, you know, if you're privileged and powerful and you're joking about somebody who isn't privileged and powerful, um, that's a no, no, you shouldn't be allowed to do that. You should apologize. You should probably lose your career and your livelihood, uh, and be out on the street, um, um, you know, begging for food and money. Um, but you know, we reject that whole thing. I think it's the most silly thing in the world. I'd be interested to hear your take on it. But as far as I'm concerned, when you, when you start talking about punching down on people, for example, 
uh, someone like me, if I was to make fun of women, that would be punching down because women are presumably beneath me. But I don't think of women as being beneath me. So I don't think it's punching down to joke at them. I think we're all created equal and that we should be able to joke about each other indiscriminately. So I reject the whole structure that views things as, you know, I think it only reinforces these ideas that there are some people who are above other people when you start talking about punching down and how that should be off limits. And the other point I'd make there is that this 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 whole thing that happened with like Dave Chappelle and and uh, and how everyone was trying to cancel him for the jokes that he was making. Um, you know, these people that claim to be so marginalized and oppressed literally have the power to end the careers of anyone who makes fun of them. So I don't think that they're really marginalized and oppressed when they have that power. If you have the will and the power to punish people who simply make fun of you, then you're actually the oppressor, not the oppressed. So I see it as the other way around. Mm, I like that. Well, I agree with you. I don't think I don't in comedy. I don't even know if there should be the rule against punching down. There should be no down, up, left, right. It should just be everyone is fair game. It's it's kind of fun to see yourself made fun of. You know, that's my view of it. It's exciting. Even when you actually go to a comedy club, if you hear your particular ethnic group or socioeconomic class or even yourself made fun of. It's funny. I remember going to this one. Um, it was a it was a benefit. It was to to benefit breast cancer survivors, and um, our friends were hosting it. And we were there. And they hired this totally inappropriate and an awesome way comedian. And um, he got up there, and there were there were people of all ages, old, young. He gets up there, and and as happens at these things, the older people, like elderly people, were sitting in the front row because they they got right. there early. They want to make sure they had a seat. And the guy stands up by saying, "Jesus, it looks like a casket exploded in here." <laughs> Now, the women who were in the front row with the gray hair were laughing harder than anyone. Good. And my good. friend who hosted the event comes over and he goes, I thought he was hilarious. And this is a shorter guy. He goes, until he started to say I needed human growth hormone. <laughs> 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 then he ripped on yeah, my husband, Doug. Funny. He called Doug a metrosexual and then accused him of having a unibrow. Doug said, that's incongruous. How, how could I be both a metrosexual and have a unibrow? It doesn't work. Anyway, my point is, it's fun to be made fun of. And we used to recognize yeah. that universally here in America. Only now, thanks to these uptight wokesters, do we have to word police all the time. Uh, it does happen on the other side a little bit, too. I mean, look, we I think it's very healthy to look at yourself and 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 you know, examine your own beliefs, your own ideology, your own behavior and and hold it up to mockery and ridicule and, and you know, see if you pass the test. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's a it's it's a fun and healthy exercise. I think I, when I go to a comedy show and people are joking about things that apply to me, I still laugh. I think it's funny. Um, I think it's and I think the Babylon Bee does a really good job of doing that. We do hit both sides of the aisle quite a bit. You do we make fun of people on our side. It's a Christian site run by Christians that makes fun of, you know, little idiosyncrasies and silly things going on in the church and evangelical Christian culture. Um, and, you know, for the most part, the audience is receptive to that and they like to laugh at themselves every now and then, you know, uh, people will bristle and they tend to object to satire and comedy really only when it lands on them. They're fine making fun of everybody else. It's the minute the joke applies to me, then it's really offensive and it's really hurtful. But I think a lot of what you're seeing in our culture today, a ton of what you're seeing in our culture today is not people who are genuinely offended. They're not, uh, they're not distraught and upset over the joke that was made at their expense. They're putting that on. It's an act. It's this, it's this fake indignation and anger um, that's meant to really give them the upper hand in a conversation, in a, in a debate about ideas that they want to win. Uh, and they don't want to, they, they realize that ridicule and mockery and comedy are effective ways of making ideas look silly and exposing them for mm -hmm. what they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they want to win that, that argument, they want to win that debate, um, they're trying to shut down people who are effectively pushing back on them. And oftentimes that's comedians. Um, I love this quote. It's by G.K. Chesterton. He said, humor can get in under the door while seriousness is still fumbling at the handle. And, uh, mm, and I think it's I like really that true of comedy. It's extremely effective. And it's one of the reasons that they attack comedians first when they're trying to, you know, be speech police. Yeah, they're so important. They really are sort of the, I don't know, canary in the coal mine in some cir circumstances to show us what the way forward is or the way you're going to get whacked. Um, exactly. To yeah. your point about making fun of anybody and anything, even if it's technically on, quote, your side, one of the most viral Babylon Bee headlines and articles was during 2017 Hurricane Harvey that devastated Houston. And Joel Osteen yes. came under fire for refusing to volunteer his Lakewood mega church building as safe shelter. All right, this is the headline from you guys. Joel Osteen sh sails luxury yacht through flooded Houston to pass out copies of Your Best Life Now. And <laughs> I've got to read part of this article. It's so funny. 
Go Although Joel Osteen took flack over the weekend for closing up his church to flood victims and all but disappearing during the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, the megachurch pastor reportedly returned to the city on his luxury yacht, SS Blessed, to make amends Tuesday by tossing copies of Your Best Life Now to stranded flood survivors. <laughs> Osteen has his, had his on-call yacht captain steer the large vessel toward the flooded streets of the city, <laughs> pulling up to survivors stranded on their roofs and on the roof of their cars as the prosperity gospel preacher smiled, waved, and threw out signed editions of the best-selling positive thinking book. Believe and declare you are coming into a shift, Osteen yelled through a bullhorn, according to reports. God wants his best for you. Enlarge your vision. Develop a healthy self-image and choose to be happy. Here's the last part. When you think positive, excellent thoughts, you will be propelled toward greatness, he called out to one family floating on a raft on a freeway-turned river <laughs> whose earthly possessions had been destroyed the previous day. <laughs> it just goes on. <laughs> now, see, that, that, that perfectly illustrates the point. If I tell you straight-faced on this show, you know, the prosperity gospel doesn't preach to everybody. There's people going through hard times and, uh, and you know, to tell them that, that they're going to experience health and wealth if they just give their life to God when they're actually in, in real life struggling. Um, and when there's something that could be done about it to, 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 you know, if you have wealth and resources to give them and you don't, instead you just tell them that, that there must be some be sin happy. in their life. Holding them. Like, that's happy. not that interesting. It's not that compelling, but the joke, but you put it in humor and you make it a joke and all of a sudden you get the point. Yes. So how, I'm so curious what the process is. Like, I always think about this with the New York Post, too, because they have the best headlines. You know, what is the process? Is it one guy who's just a, a, a machine who comes up with the most clever things? <laughs> or is it a collaborative effort wherever you sit down, you know, you sit down that morning, you say, this is ripe for, you know, us, grist for the mill, and you all like kick around headlines to come up with the funny stuff? It's a mix of the two. I mean, we have some very talented individuals who are extremely uh, productive and can just churn out one idea after another. Um, but we have a whole team of writers who are in a Slack channel, um, communicating with each other throughout the day about what's going on in the news or, or, you know, in the church or just in the culture in general, and just pitching idea. It all starts with the headline. It, the, the joke is in the headline. So you got to nail it there. So that's what we start out with is just these endless headline pitches back and forth. And then if we get kind of like a good seed thought there that, that, looks like it's going to turn into something. We'll iterate on it a little bit to try to get it right. But it's, it's very collaborative. Uh, and we work together on it until we really land on some that we know are going to get a good response from our audience once we put it out there and pair it with a funny image or Photoshop. Was it easier during the Trump era or harder? <laughs> Both. Um, you know, Trump is one of these figures. He's like, he's so outlandish. I mean, he's, he's his ego is so big. Uh, he said so many things that you just you you think you think to yourself, I couldn't have made this up. Like this is just <laughs> unbelievable that this. You want to hire him? <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. You want to just quote him verbatim. I, I would say the same for Biden. Honestly, you know, there's a lot of things that he says that's that are just you know like this gibberish will spill out of his mouth and corn pop and and you know. Oh, I, I couldn't hear you. It broke up. For oh, a I second. was saying with Biden, corn pop. You know, it's just and with oh, Trump, yeah. Kavevi. Like, wait, what? <laughs> Right. These weird things uh, that, that come out of his mouth that you just couldn't even imagine as, as a comedy writer, like thinking that up yourself. So in, in one sense, these are difficult figures to satirize. When people ask me, like the Biden administration, who's who's the easiest low hanging fruit in that administration? It's not Biden. I think Biden is actually difficult to satirize because, um, you know, he's he's like a parody of a person already. And Trump was the same way. We did mm -hmm. have one, though, just this classic one. I don't know if you remember this, but we did a, a headline on how uh, Trump claimed to have done more for Christianity than Jesus himself. Do you remember that one? <laughs> no, but it's amazing. Do it, we, you, we should like do Trump. like a true or Babylon B headline. We should do one of those. Right, right. Yeah. Is it the B or is it not the B? Yeah. But yeah, we, we published this headline back in like 2019. Liberals shared it like crazy thinking it was true. They wanted it to be true. They wanted to believe that Trump had actually said something like that. You fast forward to a month ago and Trump went on a radio show and said he's done more for Christianity and religion in general than any other person in history. <laughs> so he's like actually fulfilled that joke now as if it were a prophecy and made it come to pass. Um, and those, so that's good. the reason why people like Trump are difficult to satirize is because you know, it's hard to go beyond what they're already doing. And then if you do, it ends up coming true like a prophecy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that reminds me of a very funny situation where um, I was going on Don Imus one morning and um, 
for some reason, I wonder if my husband, my husband was there with me. It, it, Don Imus was a big fan of my husband's books. So I think he was having on my husband. And uh, mm. we went behind O'Reilly, who was on before us. And O'Reilly was promoting Killing Jesus at the time. And I remember Doug and I sitting there listening to him. And O'Reilly literally said, um, you know, we've done a ton, a ton of research. There's a lot of new information in there. We did a lot of new interviews with people who, you know, were like, of the killing of Jesus? <laughs> Right, right. How how New exactly how <laughs> we you know like you can't make it up, right? And he's right. He got a little t- touch of Trump in him too. All right, so now let's That's talk funny. about this because that is not the first time that you have predicted um, something that later came true. I mean, you guys really have lived the uh, life imitates art situation. We pulled a couple of them. Um, all okay. right, <laughs> here's the B. In um, this is May 9th. 2017. Now, people are going to know this one because they lived the follow up three years later in 2020. This is the B in 2017. The headline was two plus two equals four insists closed minded bigot (laughs) that you were joking. Um, And this is you guys back talking about an an alleged teacher and closed minded bigot, Becky Delatore, reportedly insisting that two plus two equals four, asking her class the question, what does two plus two equal? The intolerant zealot systemically or systematically (laughs) denied the possibility that the answer could be anything but four. Going so far as to single out the specific integers three and seven is wrong (laughs) and mentioned by students as possible answers. Three years later. This is from the Washington Examiner, August 10th, 2020. Math professor claims equation two plus two, quote, reeks of white supremacist patriarchy. It happened. Mm-hmm. When, when you see that, are you like, OMG? <laughs> well, it's kind of funny and it's also kind of sad. I think simultaneously it's both because, you know, on the one hand, it's like it, people people will tweet about us like Babylon B for the win. You had another one of these prophecies come true. It's like we don't want them to come true. We don't want to be winning. If this stuff is actually <laughs> happening, it means the country's means losing going down a, a really dark path. Right. All right. So here's another one. Babylon B, um, March 25th. Oh, no. Hold on. Let me get it. Uh August 13th, 2020, your fake headline, BLM rioters awarded Nobel Peace Prize. (laughs) Black Lives Matter peaceful protesters who burned down communities and violently beat all who stood in their way are the recipients of this year's Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Nobody has done more for peace than these brave, peaceful protesters, a Nobel Committee spokesperson said while presenting the award to a young man clad in all black and wielding a bike lock. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, I mean, look, we were trying to think of what would be the most ridiculous thing that you could say about what's happening right now. And when you've got like, you know, CNN reporters standing in front of burning cars and buildings saying the situation is mostly peaceful and these riots and looting are described as peaceful protests. You know, it's like the most ridiculous thing would be if they were, in fact, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And it happened a year yeah. later. The Guardian had like Black Lives Matter movement nominated for Nobel Peace Prize, January 29th, 2021. You can't make it up, right? The guy who submitted them said they have a tremendous achievement in raising global awareness and consciousness about racial injustice. Studies have shown that most of the demonstrations organized by BLM have been peaceful. Quote, of course, there have been incidents, but most of them have been caused by the activities of either the police or counter protesters. I mean, it's like it's almost like you're making it happen. Yes. Yeah. And then it's it's like they're uh, it's almost like they're copying our own headlines. I mean, we covered um, when the Abraham Accords were being signed and Trump was there uh, on site during this is in the middle of like covid when it first got really crazy. And he's like shaking hands and and meeting with people and he's not wearing a mask and he's not social distancing. We thought to ourselves, how would CNN cover this? They would probably talk about how he's like completely ignoring covid protocols, standard covid protocols. Uh, instead of focusing on the monumental moment at hand of what was actually happening. Sure enough, five hours later, CNN published a headline almost identical to ours, criticizing Trump for not social distancing or wearing a mask uh, oh, at the Abraham Accords. So uh, it's it's like you, it's easy to like guess what's going to happen because you can simply think to yourself, what would be the most insane, stupid thing that people could possibly do next <laughs> and then make a joke about that and then watch it unfold. It's 
good. It's like it's a bet on human nature. It's smart of you. I'll give you yeah, one more yeah. before we go to break. Um, Babylon B in March, uh, March 25th, 2020. Pants sales plummet as everyone working from home. <laughs> this is your joke. I'm at home all day now. So what do I need pants for? Said Carl Hampton, a computer programmer, expressing a common sentiment. I'm starting to feel dumb that I ever wore pants. Um, while shirts are still somewhat popular, pants have taken a blow. Then you go on. And then two days later, two days later, headline on Yahoo Finance. Here's why Walmart is selling more more shirts than pants during the pandemic and they talk about it saying a spike in sales of tops but not pants um there's like we've got to ask you what your next prediction is so we can know what's going to happen in the next quarter maybe it's supply chain related inflation is biden going to get those two spending bills uh passed and, and at what number um anyway we have more with seth in a moment right after this break we've got an absolutely insane microsoft video to bring you that takes announcing your pronouns to a whole new level Microsoft has been around for a while, as you know, but as the tech world has gotten increasingly woke, it has evolved as a company. This week, a video surfaced on Twitter that included an introduction to an internal event on security featuring two Microsoft employee hosts. Watch. Hello, everyone. I'm Natalia Gadilla. I'm a Caucasian woman with long blonde hair, and I go by she, her. I'm a product marketing lead here at Microsoft and co-host of the podcast Security Unlocked with this guy. Yes, that would be me. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Fillingham. I'm a Caucasian man with glasses and a beard. I go by he, him, and I'm a security evangelist here at Microsoft. OMG. <laughs> so, so name pronouns, of course, and then skin color, hair color. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Apparently, this is this part of the introduction was done for employees and viewers who are visually impaired. You got to get everybody now. Every introduction. OK, long blonde hair, glasses and a beard. Sure. OK. Why do the blind people listening need to know that you're white? Exactly. How is how is this progress? This video, however, was nothing compared to the way two more Microsoft hosts kicked off the company's Ignite 2021 stream this week. But this one went way beyond just describing the host's skin color. Listen. Hello and welcome to Microsoft Ignite. We've got a big day ahead and lots in store for you. First, we want to acknowledge that the land where the Microsoft campus is situated was traditionally <laughs> occupied by the Sammamish, the Duwamish, the Snoqualmie, the Suquamish, the Muckleshoot, the Snohomish, the Tulalip, and other Coast Salish peoples since time immemorial. A people that are still here, <laughs> continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. My name is Allison Wines. I'm a senior program manager in our developer tools division. I'm an Asian and white female with dark brown hair wearing a red sleeveless top. And I'm Seth Juarez, program manager in the AI platform group. I'm a tall Hispanic male wearing a blue shirt, khaki pants. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Wait a minute, where are your pronouns, Allison and Seth, you bigots? <laughs> Honestly, like, can you believe these people are running companies? Apparently, Microsoft, while raking in its billions, did not feel compelled to, I don't know, move the campus away from the land occupied by all those Native American tribes there for time immemorial or pay any sort of restitution over their crimes. No, just a little mention by Allison. <laughs> That'll do it. And then on to the race focused intros and then tech lingo. And we're off to ignite. <laughs> and we feel so much better about ourselves as good people. And this has been the latest edition of Sound Up. Seth, you can't make it up. What about the poor Samamish and the muckle shoots? <laughs> what are I, we supposed to do about them? I love that you're laughing because the appropriate response to this stuff is laughter. It's ridicule, right? Ridicule this nonsense, mock it because it really is silly. I, I felt like I was watching a skit, like an SNL skit the whole totally. time I was watching those clips. It's just like... It's unbelievable that people are saying this with a straight face describing their physical appearance. But the silly thing is with wokeness, whiteness is like is like the pinnacle of evil. Whiteness is you're, if you're white, you're evil incarnate. So to, to announce that you're white, that's basically a confession. I can't believe they didn't apologize on the heels of that.
Yeah. Oh, exactly right. It's so, I mean, as I was saying, like, is that progress? I'm white. I have to tell everybody the blind people must know my skin color because that's going to put me, of course, into, you know, a certain category. And in your case, white male, you know, patriarchal, whatever. They've got to make all the yeah. assumptions that, you know, we're now trying to put back into the American psyche when it comes to skin color. It's so backward. Yeah. Yeah. It's very backward. It's, it's, it's literally reinforcing all of these ideas that, that really it's, it's making skin color and gender and sex, the most important thing about you. And when you're talking about like a business thing, this is where it gets weird in business. It's like the people that you're hearing from, you want to know what their credentials are, right? You want to know that they're qualified to talk to you about what they're talking to you about. It doesn't really matter how long their hair is or what color their skin is or what gender they are, as long as they're like, is the right person for the job. And they're the person that should be speaking to you about this particular product or service. Here's my question. Steve Krakauer, our executive producer. Are we sure this is real? Are we sure this is not an attempt at being the Babylon Bee? Good question. Right? That this is all just like a setup to it's you're sure he's saying it's real. <laughs> I know, but, but I feel like maybe it's just bait. He says we pull the video from their website. Maybe it's just bait okay. to see if we'll take it. I mean, the, the problem is it's hard to know because it seems totally realistic in today's day and age that they'd be doing this. And he is assuring me in my ear. It is real. Can we see it again? I need to see Muckle Shoot one more time. Watch. Hello and welcome to Microsoft Ignite. We've got a big day ahead and lots in store for you. First, we want to acknowledge that the land where the Microsoft campus is situated was traditionally occupied by the Sammamish, the Duwamish, the Snoqualmie, the Suquamish, the Muckleshoot, the Snohomish, the Tulalip, and other Coast Salish peoples since time immemorial. A people that are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient okay. heritage. <laughs> My <laughs> name she really is did Allison say it all. Wines. I'm a senior. Duwamish, Snohomish. I mean, you t Seth, if SNL doesn't touch that, they must go away. They must implode and never be watched again. Okay, but I'm going to push back on that because how do they touch that? How do they make it funnier than it already is? Tell me how they do. <laughs> how do they stretch it? <laughs> There's got to be a way. <laughs> the the Snohomish. I mean, you've got to make it like I don't know quintuple. S syllabic <laughs> right like you gotta just, there's got to be a way of making it even more outrageous and and for the people who are listening go what well, you can watch this on youtube on our youtube channel later but um isn't she, this what's her, silly about virtue turn, signaling though like what the are they she actually turns? doing about it no, i don't know it's basically just start anything. all those native tribes bye and here's all our millions right. look at me my in my cute sweater <laughs> the, the thing is um if you watch it on video, she does like the, the dramatic side turn, you know, like, hi, I'm Allison. And now an apology to the Snow Amish and some Amish and Muckle Shoot. <laughs> As if anybody has ever said to themselves, God, I want the Muckle Shoots are going to be pissed. What the? Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they feel this good, is, though. They feel very good about themselves. And this brings me to your new book. Okay, the, the book is called, this is actually a great idea for the holidays, I have to say. Nobody's paying me to say that. I just genuinely think this is a brilliant gift. The Babylon Bee Guide to Wokeness. How to take your wokeness to the next level by canceling friends, breaking windows, and burning it all to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just published this week. And um, it, it walks you through what it's like, what it really means to be woke. And it starts with the following. Introduction. Being woke means realizing the problems in your life are not your fault. Nothing is your fault. Finding the racism, sexism, and hatred in everything. <laughs> Changing your profile picture to match the current fad. Brainwashing your kids to hate life and be miserable. Rioting in the name of justice. And becoming an absolute horrible person to be around. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you that's what it is. It's a how-to guide on how to accomplish all of those things. And it starts by, you may think to yourself, Megan, I'm not a racist. I don't harbor hate in my heart. I, I'm not, you know, I like, I love other people regardless of their skin color. I have friends who are, who are, are darker skinned than I am. That is exactly what a racist would think and say. And you have to realize that first and, <laughs> and come to grips with your own racism and your blindness to it before you can become truly woke. So uh, that's what this book is. It's a, it's a guide. It's a detailed guide with lots of little like charts and graphs and, and it's, yes. uh, it's pretty funny. And I think, I think you're right. It is the perfect holiday gift. We've got some of that. Let me show the full screen of the two brains. This is uh, from, the, from the book. The full screen for the listeners shows the, your regular brain on the left. And it looks like a sort of a, it's not 
filled in. It's like white and the one on the right is yellow. So you can see it's stuff's going on. But the, the regular brain has got a part that controls hunger, cognitive planning, imagination, joy, wonder. The woke brain, which is all colored in sort of peachy orange, offended, 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 offended <laughs> every part of the brain at all times. And the book does make the point about, you know, tackling tackling racism, which is a serious thing and the warning signs of it. Racist. These are the signs that you might be one. Being white, capitalism, band-aids, Dr. Seuss book, books, math, asking someone where they're from, meritocracy, being colorblind, disagreeing with Marxism, Taco Tuesday, having a black friend, drinking milk, not racist, judging someone by the color of their skin. Oh my God, this is so brilliant. <laughs> that's Did you the write only this? thing that's not racist is, is basing everything on skin color, right? Everything else is racist, including two plus two equals four. Um, yes. That's the backwards upside down world that we're in. So yeah, the book is trying to highlight all of that, draw that to the surface and, uh, and, uh, and confront it with a laugh, which I think and, it deserves. Yes. And really, really effectively know the signs of secret racism as well. One, you breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. <laughs> You two, you have feet. Three, you say, I'm not a racist. Four, you judge people not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. Five, you like vanilla ice cream. Six, you've mispronounced someone's name before, especially a person of color. Seven, you believe two plus two equals four. Eight, you smile pleasantly and say hello to people of color. Nine, you don't capitalize bold and underline the word black. Ten, you exist. <laughs> <laughs> this is straight out of Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility. This is basically her whole theme. Right. Basically. Yeah. I mean, those are all the things that you actually do get. A, well, the feet thing is a little ridiculous. I think the joke, the little caption underneath it is, well, you know, KKK members and Nazis had feet and you do too. So there is a correlation there. Um, that, <laughs> that's silly. But, but the other stuff, I mean, these are real <laughs> things that you're actually accused. If you say, if you're polite to minorities, then you're like going out of your way to try to make them feel comfortable. And that's condescending. And that makes them actually mm -hmm. more uncomfortable. And that's racist. Mm -hmm. This kind of stuff is everywhere. It's toxic. It's, it's insane. It is, it is racism. You know, you had like this Virginia election that just happened. The, the women uh, that came out in droves to vote in that election for a Republican were accused of white supremacy. Uh, because because they simply didn't vote the way that they were supposed to vote. So yep. there's a certain way you have to vote in order to be woke too. And so our book helps you with that. You have to get used to being called those crazy terms if you're going to talk about the news in any sort of an open way or just life in any sort of an open way, because they, they will call you that. Um, you you talk about how to, how to spot oppressed women, long, pretty hair, making a sandwich. <laughs> Smells like essential oil, surrounded by cute little adoring kids. How to spot liberated women. Womb slowly turning into vacant husk. <laughs> <laughs> Short hair, bags under eyes from working 80 hour a week, Tinder dating app on phone, birth control and purse, surrounded by cats. <laughs> <laughs> Did it say purple hair? Purple hair should be on there somewhere. Purple hair must be on there. I'm sure. I've got short. I'm, I'm not sure I have the entire list, but it's brilliant. And then you've got uh, take take some fun poking at uh, poking fun at climate change. This is this is yeah. how you're doing it wrong. If you care about the environment, here's a graphic from the back of the book. Earth rape. It says how it works. Warning. Disturbing. The first picture <laughs> is of a woman standing there, and it reads inhale. Attacker, attacker premeditate meditates crime. He, she will perpetrate on victim. Prepares for assault. Middle picture, rest. Attacker charges up CO CO two. Blast from inside the black the black empty void that once held a soul. <laughs> and the last one is exhale. Earth is raped. <laughs> <laughs> so there's nothing sacred to you. You'll take aim at any one thing. Does this? Does this result in any actual blowback in your business model or your personal life? Uh, well, I mean, I, the business model is under threat from stuff like we were talking about earlier with like the New York Times maligning us or misrepresenting us or like the fact checking uh, resulting in our content not getting, um, you know, as much reach as it used to get on the social networks. Uh, but, you know, these are the kinds of jokes that we've always made. And it's not really like any one particular joke gets people really mad and they can like cancel us. There is no real direct way to cancel us because we're not like we're not like on some network somewhere where we could be taken off the network. You know, we don't have bosses who could fire us. We, we you know, we, we're not going to cancel ourselves and go away. 
So ultimately, they, you know, there's these roundabout ways that they try to come after us by saying that we're hate speech under the guise of satire or we're misinformation under the guise of satire. And those are the ways that they're trying to come after us. So there have been like real world actual effects of that. But honestly, a lot of the things that they're trying to do to silence our voice amplify it. We end up doing more media appearances and talking about this stuff more. There's a lot of backfiring that happens whenever they're trying to get somebody to shut up. And it happens in the elections, too. I mean, look, you, it, when, when the left vilifies white people and calls white people evil you're basically the devil incarnate you're you're literally hitler you know like you're you're so evil just because you're white and then you decide to vote for somebody else who doesn't talk about you that way they act like that somehow justifies their treatment of you and they double Confirms down all their and call suspicions. you racist for not voting the way they wanted you to vote in the first place it's so true that is so true so but wait so has facebook been messing with you and you know the algorithm and sort of the hits on on the b Oh, yeah. Yeah. Drastically. Our, our reach on Facebook is uh, like 30 percent, 20 percent of what it was a year or two ago when our when we had a much small, uh, smaller audience than we have now. So our audience has grown. Our reach has declined. I joked recently on, on Tucker about how like we had one article that, that got viewed by like 11 people when we posted on Facebook and we could have reached more people if we would printed it out and like nailed it to a telephone pole in a small town. It's like <laughs> they are throttling uh, how much our trap, our, our, our articles get shown. And I think it's because we're fact checked so much and they've given us a news quality score and it's like a low score. They're scoring us as like an unreliable news source. And the whole That's point insane. is that we're not a news source. Not at we're, all. We're, right. We make jokes. So jokes don't have a truth rating. We're living in this weird era where jokes are now true or false. They're not funny or not funny. Um, they're either, you know, offensive and hurtful hate speech or they're, you know, acceptable forms of, you know, uh, conforming ideologically correct, politically correct speech. Um, so, you know, it's a weird time to be doing comedy. That's for sure. But mm -hmm. there, there are certainly some of those effects going on. It's so maddening, right? It's like you've got to please the bosses at Facebook in order to get the traffic that you're entitled to, you know, that you otherwise would have if they just didn't interfere. Um, but yeah, and I'm sure if your jokes were going the other way, if they were at the expense of Trump or Trump voters, you wouldn't be mm -hmm. having this sort of suppression. I don't know how exactly it works. I just know that they're a lot more careful about checking um, people like John Stossel, people like what well, even me uh, but certainly the ben shapiro's of the world and the and the babylon bees because you're out there very openly not saying the things they want well I, i'll give you one example of one that was like uh, so silly that it got fact checked there's some it's really if you've seen like a list of our fact checked articles it's really really funny it's funnier than the articles themselves it's but we ridiculous. did one about how uh the ninth circuit court had overruled the death of ruth bader ginsburg <laughs> overruled her death <laughs> and it's it's just this silly thing. It's like the washing machine joke we did back in 2018 about how CNN had purchased an industrial sized washing machine to spin the news in before publishing it. Like it's what it's one of those just outlandish, silly stories like that's not but really possible. It couldn't that be is true. Not a Why thing. are you going to fact check that? What was that? Yeah, but no, the Ninth Circuit cannot overrule a death. That is not a thing. And yet that was not fact checked thing. by USA Today. Yeah. Yeah, USA Today fact checked that, and Facebook paid for it. If you scroll down to the bottom of it, it says Facebook paid oh, this uh, paid for um, parts of our fact checking department are like funded in, by grants from Facebook or something like that. So Facebook is out there paying fact checkers to rate jokes false, so that then Facebook can then go to those comedians who told those jokes and say, "Stop sharing this false information, or we're going to take you off our platform." That is so crazy. There, another one. Uh, Reuters fact checked uh, the article by the B um, saying Nancy Pelosi thanked babies for sacrificing their lives for women's rights. I mean, like, <laughs> how, all I could think was how stupid are people? People are so stupid, right? That they that they a believed this and that b that Reuters would then take the time Reuters to actually figure out you know how you got it wrong. How Nancy Pelosi right. never said that sometimes it's the people's fault. I think a lot of times it's not because uh, like we've discussed, I mean, the world is so crazy. You have like, you have Laurel Hubbard being named a uh, sports woman of the year and you have uh, what's her name. I'm forgetting the Lieutenant governor's name that was just elected in Virginia. Um, Winsome Sears. Uh, Winsome Sears. Yeah. Winsome Sears is called a white supremacist. Right. So, you know, men or women, black people are white supremacists. You, this, you can't make this stuff up. The world is too absurd to be satirized. And so I give people a pass when they believe these jokes are real, uh, because in the, in the current climate that we're in, you watch real headlines and they're just as unbelievable as the satire. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll tell you one group that would not have been fooled, and that's the Duomish. They, they would have been <laughs> honest, given their lifetime experience, the, the Snohomish 
<laughs> the muckle shoots, they would have been all over this. And it's it's good that we're bringing them back and apologizing for the, the many offenses that we've caused. Seth, what a pleasure. Keep keep on going. We all love it. It's You've brought me so many laughs over the years. You have no idea. And uh, just promise me you'll keep it going. Don't sell it. Don't close it. I won't. I won't. And here's the book. If you want to go buy it, The Babylon Bee Guide to Wokeness, please go check it out. It's uh, it's pretty fun. It's a lot of fun. A hundred percent. And that genuinely will make a great, great Christmas gift or a holiday present. So do it. And everybody who gets it will be in on the joke. All the best. See you soon, Seth. I want to take this opportunity to tell you about is a programming note. On Monday, we have an exclusive interview with Dustin Heiss. Do you know that name? He is suing Don Lemon, accusing him of alleged sexual assault. This will be his first interview, and we are going to get into the case that everyone in the media is ignoring. Why? Because Don Lemon, the the man who lectures us all on morality, is untouchable? No, he's not. Uh, So we will have that interview for you right here on Monday, live. Don't miss it. In the meantime, subscribe to the show so you don't miss it. YouTube.com slash Megyn Kelly and download all the shows. Have a great weekend.